Regrettably, we're not able to conduct the field activities that we normally would for our course. And in order to keep us on track in terms of skill development, what I'm gonna do this week is give you an introduction to these sites so that we can continue the work and the uh, training that the course offers in analyzing the forest structure and comparing different forests. So we've got seven sites that we're going to give you a quick introduction to. Um, this is the group last, from last fall who collected the data that are being used this quarter in class. And I'm gonna come back to this photo in a little, in a little while um, in order to say something about the site that we're at. The first site that we work at is uh, or the first one that we want to highlight actually is a high elevation mixed conifer forest in the southern Sierra Nevadas. This is the Needles site. It's near the Needles rock formations in the southern Sierra. It's high elevation, seven to 9,000 feet. Um, and it's a uh, typical Sierra mixed conifer stand, white fir, red fir, ponderosa pine and sugar pine. And one of the reasons why I like to take our class to this forest is because this forest type is representative of one that occurs throughout the entirety of the range. At higher elevations, between six to eight, it's occasionally 9,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada, uh, where the range is wetter, where the range has a longer lasting uh, snowpack. You have, dumb, uh, you have this forest type, it's very productive in terms of the biomass and wood production, and it's important for a lot of different reasons, uh, for as a timber resource as well as an important location where our water, uh, our principal water reservoir is provisioned. The other reason to go up to the, the Needles area um, is to see firsthand the historic bark beetle outbreak, which is ongoing, which has killed uh, hundreds of millions of trees in the Sierra Nevada. And the photo on the right is from uh, our field site uh, that was taken in 2015, I believe. Uh, mortality, the mortality rate is not nearly as high as it had been in this area, but there's still lots of dead trees and the forests have been by and large transformed. The bark beetle outbreak has been greatest in the southern Sierra, but it's impacted areas throughout the Sierra Nevada, including um, Yosemite Valley and other areas like it. You can see that on the, on the left. The second site that we visit is actually very near the uh, needle stand, it's uh, lower elevation, about a thousand or uh, 1500 feet lower in elevation. And this is an old growth stand in, uh, it's called Freeman Creek. It's a sequoia stand, it's in Sequoia National Forest. It's not in the national park, but it is a old growth stand. Um, this is an area with very old trees. Uh, these trees are uh, believe these trees are in the thousands of years old. Some really impressive trees here, some with hollow, uh, hollow trees and other structure, uh, tree structures that are typical of old growth forests. It still, by and large, um, has a very similar composition, species composition to the needles. And like I said, it's not very far away. Um, lots of fir and pine in addition to the old growth, uh, in addition to the giant sequoia here. So here's a series of photos of ongoing research uh, at this site and in uh, the Sierra uh, sequoia stands overall. And I'm gonna hand things over to Daniel here, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about his work in these stands and um, what he was doing. There. Um, so this study is specifically the giant sequoias and their response to the 10, 10 or so years of drought that was yeah, plaguing California from the 
early 2000s. I'm not sure the exact year off the top of my head. Um, but the drought, yeah, had just ended a couple of years ago. And so I got to work with him for the last like three years of the study. And so, yeah, this is a really cool research project. They're trying to measure the water potential in the needles to, well, yeah, try to measure the water potential in the needles. That's this lower right-hand picture is, um, yeah, they're measuring the pressure of water in the needles. And with that, they can determine how stressed the tree is under conditions. And so taking that over the 10 to 12 years of in, during the drought, through the entirety of the drought, and then the three years after the drought, they're able to quantify changes in stress um, of the trees during those times. And so, yeah, it starts with Anthony holding a crossbow up in the right-hand corner, and he's got a fishing reel on the bottom of that. And so he would use that to shoot over the highest part of the branches, and then you'd jug your way to the top and kind of lasso and scramble yourself up the last 50 feet or so to the very top where you have to get the where you have to get the samples that are in the sunshine um yeah so that's that's essentially what the project was about the the final determination um was that the redwoods are generally a lot more resilient than any of the other trees in the area. But one thing that we found towards the end of the project was that bark beetles have been affecting the redwoods, redwoods, which up until that point had never been documented. And that was actually first discovered by a branch that we had knocked down on the ground and someone working with us on the ground picked it up and looked at it and saw bark beetle boars in there. And so I don't know if you guys have read, there was an article on a lot of popular news stations like The Guardian um, and yeah, CNN picked it up about, yeah, the susceptibility of these trees to bark beetles. And so that's a pretty surprising direction that the research turn towards the end was scoping out trees and trying to find trees with potential bark beetle damage. So lots of possibilities in research like this. Uh, Daniel, it was the um, uh, cedar twig beetle, correct? Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, that's a, just so you know, that's a different beetle than the dendroctinus beetles or the scolitis beetles that attack ponderosa pine and sugar pine and, and um, fir. Right. You know, uh, certainly something, I mean, these trees are irreplaceable, so it certainly makes sense to look at them. Um, and, uh, but, but just so you know, it's, it's not the same, it's a different species of bark beetle. Right. Right. Cool. I'm gonna um, just pause the, um, I'm going to pause the recording real quick. Okay, so um, as I, uh, that's our, that's our giant sequoia stand. It's really cool. Um, some of these trees are actually hollow. Uh, and uh, one of them, Daniel showed us, you can crawl into. And uh, he, he pointed out another one. I think it's like, it's actually the tree with the largest diameter. It's, uh, it has no entrance from the ground, but it's actually hollow. And Daniel, you've, you've rappelled down into that, right? Yeah, that one's really cool because, yeah, we, we were there just for fun one weekend. And so, yeah, you climb to the top, and then it's hollowed out all the way to the ground. And so you just rappel 200 feet into this cave tree, and then, you, then you're just standing on the ground in this dark little tunnel. Really nice down there. There's some salamanders and frogs. Wild. So like I say, um, you know, uh, if you can make our field trip, you are more than welcome to attend. And uh, it was enjoyable last time. And of course, you wouldn't have to do any of the field work. So it's even possibly even more fun. Um,
so that's our that's the second site that we go to uh, and we we do to those two sites on our first day and then the, the next day we go to two more sites that are near where we camp and the first one is um this place called the kern river preserve and it's a nature conservancy reserve um near the town of onyx which is uh on the 178 uh this is a uh, this part of uh the south fork of the kern river that flows through a um this wide uh, fairly flat valley and it has what I what I think is what what is to, to my experience the most impressive Fremont Cottonwood stand that I know about. Uh, Fremont Cottonwood is a riparian forest of the southwestern United States. These are deciduous forests um, pretty much throughout its range even in the warmest areas such as um, you know out in the deserts and stuff they're they're still deciduous um, they're wet places uh, like i say the valley is wide and flat in this area and even in um late july which is when i i took uh, these photographs under the canopy there's still standing water um, they do flood in the spring especially after snow melt and um, the water can get fairly deep so these, uh, these trees have to be able to tolerate it, it being inundated by water. And one of their characteristics, one of the characteristics of riparian trees is, and there's, there's variation in to the extent which this is, which, to which this is the case. But in general, riparian trees have part of their root system in contact with the water column or with soils that are generally saturated with water. What that means is that these trees are able to run their photosynthesis irregardless of a seasonal drought. That means that, a, that these stands can have really wild, surprisingly high levels of productivity. They can grow quite fast and get a lot of biomass. Um, they're all, they can also be rather dense forests, um, or at least uh, very, I should say, I take that back, not always, uh, what, what was surprising to me is how dark they are. They can be dense, but they are frequently very dark forests. And the reason I think for that is, is because these stands have virtually no water limitation, and that's very different than most of the forests that we encounter in California. There's virtually no water limitation. There's adequate nutrients here, and that means that all the competition is for light. So the results of that are canopies that are growing together, um, you know, growth, competition between trees for light. Uh, actually, in the areas, and this is on the farthest right photograph, the areas where you have um, established stands all overstory, there's very little in the understory and, and you only find regeneration around things like this dead tree that you're seeing in the, in the furthest right photograph. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the Kern River Preserve, Fremont Cottonwood Forest. It's all dominated by just, virtually exclusively by a single species. There are a few other uh, species in there, including a few canopy species. A really interesting and um, kind of unique place. Uh, up there, Fremont Cottonwood Forests were more widespread in the Southeast, uh, excuse me, in the Southwest, prior to uh, widespread extraction of groundwater and, and water diversion. But the, the Kern River Preserve is really interesting place. And then the last uh, place that we go on our, our uh, weekend field trip is to Walker Pass. And um, this is not far from that Fremont Cottonwood stand. We, we drive about 25 minutes um, up the canyon to this location. And this is right at the crest of the, of the Sierra. We stand in Walker Pass and um, you, know, you can look to the east and you're seeing out into the Mojave Desert and you can turn around and look west and you're seeing back down into the Kern River Canyon. This is a dry pinyon pine forest. Um, that's me uh, 
during that trip and you can see the the joshua trees this uh, yucca relatives that are behind me uh to my right um you know it's it's hot it's dry this stand is also has also been um severely impacted by yet another species of bark beetle the pinion ips and uh, pinion ips has been has killed a lot of trees in the sierra nevada it hasn't been as much of a newsmaker, um, you know, with the dendroctinus, which has killed most of the trees in the Sierra Nevada, but um, oh, the Walker Pass area, it's it's right on the on the margins on this on this the edge of the range of of pinyon pine. This is right when you're getting it from transition from pinyon pine into grassland, and that's an area where there's there's going to be a lot of environmental stress even under the best of circumstances. And it's not surprising that something that's a relatively weak bark beetle, Ips in this case, might overwhelm these forests. So um, the other thing to kind of point out, and <clears throat> I have a tendency to take pictures of dead trees, but I just want to emphasize that not everything is dead in this stand. There are live pinion. And in particular, when you revisit this photograph, this is the class. This is we're all celebrating, got you know, having gotten through the um, the field trip here. This is looking back to the west, and you can see that there are hillsides where most of the trees are alive here. So just you know, um, don't don't misunderstand. This is um, you know there there are air, there are patches where lots of in this pinyon pine forest patches of mortality and then patches of healthy trees. And this is just a, a photograph from the uh, from the east side. And um, when you go down out of Walker Pass and you look back to the west, it doesn't look like this. This is in Bishop, but it's just a picture of this Great Basin sage sagebrush ecosystems. And like I say, as you go down from Walker Pass, you leave forests, you get into dry areas. It's no longer wet enough to support forests, and everything changes after that. So this is right at that margin where we transition from forest to non-forest. It's why one of the reasons why we go there. Okay, and and actually the 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 first that's our weekend field trip and kind of the the most exciting thing that we do in the class. Um, but the first uh, the first and last uh, field work sessions are actually local. Uh, what we do in the first um, in our first lab for this class is actually go just we just go to Poly Canyon to practice the field measurement techniques. We look at two different stands. One is a riparian forest in Poly Canyon, and and the uh, riparian species in this local ecosystem are California sycamore. So again, a deciduous species, a species of tree that is in contact with the water column or saturated soils. Um, if you are around California sycamore, or next time that you that you are around this uh, this species and forest type, have a look. Every time you see it, there's going to be some something special about water status there. Uh, in uh, Stenner Creek, the next drainage over, or in Poly Canyon, which is Bilzaro Creek. It sounds like, you know, I can't remember the name of it exactly, but um, anyway, there's water there year round. That's why uh, the sycamore is there. That's why it's able to persist. Uh, we, anyway, we go into these areas and practice our techniques and measure another forest type. And then on the right is a photograph of, uh, of Poly Canyon in this, and we go to a second site there and do a second plot that's in an upland oak forest. And one of the, Nice comparisons uh, doing a riparian forest stand, measuring a riparian forest in Poly Canyon versus uh, an upland oak is, uh, is one of the reasons we do it is because it reflects what we do later in the weekend field trip. We measure a riparian forest, Fremont Cottonwood in the lowlands, and then go to the uplands, which are drier and hotter in this uh, pinyon pine forest. Anyway, our, um, our, our actually, sorry, uh, the typo here, it's our sixth site is uh, the Poly Canyon Upland Coast Live Oak Forest. And it's a pretty familiar forest type. Bay Laurel, a few Bay Laurel, and mostly Coast Live Oak. 
And then the last place we go is actually to Montana de Oro, and we go to the eucalyptus plantation. How many of you have been to this plantation for your other classes? One, that's it? Two, okay, three, yeah, cool. Just curious. Um, it's uh, both like one of the crappiest places to go and also kind of, um, kind of one of the more informative. The, uh, well, the reason that I think it's useful to take forest ecology to this location is because it is a plantation. Plantation forestry is a very effective way to grow timber, to grow fiber. There is a place for plantation forestry in sustainable forestry, in sustainable natural resource management. Uh, and when you look at the characteristics of this forest, it's it, generally its density, its biomass levels. Um, I think it's a, a decent reflection of how one would do plantation forestry. The problem uh, with this is that the wood quality is terrible. Uh, this never should have been done. This is um, the wood quality in the stand is terrible. The form of the trees is terrible. The, uh, there is no market for this wood. There probably never has been a market for this wood. And this project, this plantation project, is an abysmal failure. <laughs> um, and now we're stuck with it. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Um, how many of you have an opinion about eucalyptus? Just whether, whether you like it or not, whether you like it or hate it, how many of you have an opinion? Just raise your hand if you, if you have an opinion. Okay, yeah, you know, most of us have, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of like, I, I have an opinion about eucalyptus and it's this, I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe that's not an opinion. Like, I, well, I guess I do get it. I, 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 do, I, I, do, I, sorry, I do have an opinion, which is, I think it's almost always a mistake. I think growing it is almost always a mistake. I, I don't hate it. I don't love it. I just don't understand what, my question is why. <laughs> um, but there is a big plantation here. It's kind of controversial. Some people would like to see it gone. Others value it. Um, eucalyptus is grown here for and extensively in the central coast and elsewhere i think for one reason because it will grow here it grows rapid it grows tall and it is doing that in a in stabilized dunes it's growing in a sand or it's growing in sand sand is not an easy place for trees to grow um, there are a lot of problems and it can it can do it here and that's I think one of the reasons why it was grown here as as a as a potential timber species. Now this photograph this graph and the uh, map here all from uh, Brad Collins. Um, if you know Brad he just graduated in, in May and uh, uh, slipped right into a job with the um, California State Parks. Um, he sent this uh, report to me just last week. Uh, I think this was his first project with his, his new job. Um, he went out, surveyed the uh, state parks forests, did a whole kind of analysis, uh, I think worked up what, I, what seems to be unprecedented data to me about the density of these stands, basal area. And uh, he has the interesting task of, of figuring out what do you do about this stand? How do you manage it? Should they be trying to reduce some of the cover of, of eucalyptus? Um, it's a huge project and it could be something, if he gets it, if he is able to resolve it in one way or another in the course of his career, and keep in mind, Brad just graduated from Cal Poly. He just graduated. If he can resolve this in the course of his career, 35 years, whatever, he will be throwing down, absolutely throwing down. So, um, anybody know Brad? 
Yeah, I, yeah cool. Yeah, great. I, I'm thinking that, uh, he, like I say, he just sent this to me out of the blue last week, and I want to get him into our class to kind of talk to him about it. Like, how'd you, how did this all work out? And what the heck are you going to do about it? <laughs> I think it's going to be a real hard project, and I think that it's, um, but I think it's a good project. I think it's needed.